Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm sure you all know by now that our guest for the uh, fifth PL Talks is uh, my friend Jarvis Hall. Uh, Jarvis is the son of Calgary, Alberta, and Canadian art royalty. His parents, his parents are John and Joyce Hall. And he's the brother of the representational and portrait painter Janine Hall, who I'm glad to say is here tonight. His wife uh, is a terrific painter and curator by the name of Shannon Norberg, and she's here as well. Together, Jarvis and Shannon run the uh, Jarvis Hall Gallery and Fine Framing, where they represent a dynamic roster of emerging mid-career and established artists from all over North America. Jarvis is a powerful advocate for contemporary visual culture. Jarvis attended the Faculty of Fine Arts at the University of Calgary where he studied acting. In his 20s, Jarvis was an actor and his acting CV includes shows at ATB Theatre Calgary and One Yellow Rabbit. He's performed in Calgary and across the country in various productions. But like many artists, actors early in their career, Jarvis in the early 90s sought out a job to help buy groceries and house his family. Uh, he worked first at Prince Charming where his sister Janine taught him some basics of framing. He then went to work at Paul Kuhn Fine Arts, where he was mentored by Paul Kuhn and Kevin Kaneshiro in the art of the frame. It was at Paul Kuhn Fine Arts where my wife Carolyn and I first met Jarvis. Over the years, Jarvis has framed dozens of pieces of art for us. Our office here and the lobby of this building in our <coughs> home contain many pieces of art that have been completed by Jarvis. And as we'll see when we discuss what we mean by that completion of the frame. As collectors, Carolyn and I have learned to see the frame as something we bring as the owner to the piece, to the completion of the piece. And uh, Jarvis is an amazing man to collaborate with. We have learned to trust him both for his excellent taste and for his devotion to the history of art and the history of the frame. Jarvis is known nationally to be one of the finest frame makers in the country. For over 20 years, Jarvis has honed his skills by working and studying with internationally famous framers. His range includes clean contemporary hardwood frames, strengthened and enhanced with creative joiner, hand-carved, and gilded historic replicas. He works for discerning collectors, some of whom are here, and institutions. His frames have traveled throughout North America and Europe and have accompanied the works of Jack Bush, Jean-Paul Riepel, Emily Carr, Claude Monet, Miro, Tom Thompson, the Group of Seven, to name a few. I was delighted when Jarvis agreed to be our fifth speaker. He meets all of our criteria. He's a true Albertan, he makes great art, and he gives back to the art community. And besides all of that, he is quite simply a delightful human being. I ask you now to join me in welcoming Jarvis Hall. Well, uh, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Nowhere to go from there. You can write my bios all the time. <laughs> I told Jarvis he was such a modest individual that I wouldn't let him know what I was going to say <laughs> for fear he left. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, it's, great. it's great that this many people are here to talk about the uh, low-hanging fruit of the art world, the picture frame. Um, uh, it's funny uh, that you should say uh, modest. Um, as an actor, I used to per perform, in performance as an actor, you do somebody else's work. Somebody else wrote the play, wrote the film, whatever. And you as an actor produced 
and presented their work in the best of your abilities. And it's funny that I should end up as a framer. I have the same job. My job is to present and uh, the, the artwork in the best possible light where framing is concerned. Prince Charming is a great place to start because I was the only, at, when I started, the only male employee of the place. And so I would occasionally have to answer the phone. Good morning, Prince Charming. <laughs> to which I would, there would be a pause almost all the time. And they would say, are you really? <laughs> so thanks, Janine. But I was glad, glad to get out of there. <laughs> so, so years ago, um, I, uh, I saw a piece on auction in Toronto and a mutual friend of ours, uh, Doug McLean, happened to be in Toronto at the same time. And um, I asked, I, I said to him, I like this piece, although I can't tell from the digital image whether it would be something to buy. And so Doug went over and saw it and said, uh, it's beautiful, but you'll have to talk to Jarvis. <laughs> and with, with, uh, that's this image, and this is the image from the auction house. So that's an Otto Rogers painting. Um, uh, and I, I came about it, just as Jeff said, he brought it into the shop and said, what can we do for this? And I thought, given the way it was framed, um, we're doing a few of these before and afters. And this is related to how a frame can perhaps um, impede the viewing of an artwork, or it can uh, support in the best way the viewing of an artwork. And in this case, uh, my thoughts on it were simply that the white surround, which is a white linen mat, um, sort of steals the thunder from the painting. The painting seems to me to be about um, a tonality, a certain mood that, that Otto's given, given the range of color that he's used. Um, and so, Right away, I think to you, I said, if you can trust me, I think it would be really lovely to get it out of that halo <laughs> and into something that supports it in a sort of better way. Um, quick, quick note on linen mats. I'm sure we all have them in our collections. I don't, but <laughs> <laughs> some of you may have them and they're totally fine. <laughs> I'm okay with them. However, so you know, they don't exist in the framing world until the mid 70s. So if you go to any museum on the planet, you'll see gold or silver or painted wood right up against the painting. There's not this bright white halo, as I call them, around the picture, right? The reasons for that are that the painting is meant to be viewed through a window. There's not a lot of windows that have this matting. This comes about in the, from the 50s. Some of the artists were making their own frames, uh, the modernists, and they would use thick burlap and jute, this heavy fabric in the back of their frames. And somehow in the 70s, it turned into bone white, <laughs> um, super bright linen surrounds, which we see all the time. Um, so I wanted to free this painting from it. And this is where we ended up. Um, it, it does its job, it's there, a frame is there to protect the art. That's our number one job. The second job is it shouldn't get in the way of viewing it, right? So that frame definitely is protecting the canvas, but I think uh, does a better job of explaining perhaps what Otto had in mind with that painting. All of a sudden now that white, the light line right down the middle of the canvas comes forward where it was supposed to be, right? Whereas with that white linen around it, you just couldn't find how to read that painting. So I think you thought it was successful. Oh, oh, it's absolutely a delight. Now, the the challenge, of course, is is that I found myself thinking I was very shrewd to uh, buy the painting because nobody had bid on it because of the, I think of the way it was framed. Uh, but then Jarvis sent me his bill, and so <laughs> it, it ended up costing me the same. <laughs> 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 wow.
<laughs> it's all labor, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, there's an expense to framing, right? Like, uh, and especially fine art framing, because we do have, we're, we, we have a responsibility sort of in the trenches to do the right thing for the piece of art. So if it's paper, we have to use the proper archival materials, glazing, mounts, all of these things. And yeah, it's not you know, the least expensive thing. However, hopefully if done right, uh, your client sort of takes a deep breath and then falls in love with what you've done with it. And I think that's a pretty good sort of indicator as to uh, how a so-so frame can kind of perhaps hold a good painting back and how what I would hope is a good frame can sort of really uh, promote the painting in its best way. Now, this is a, an artist that's from this area, uh, Marion Nickel. Uh, it's a painting that a client brought in, and she had bought it at a, another uh, gallery, I don't know where, and it came into my shop like this. Same, same, this is sort of the same argument twice, so I'll talk about a couple of different things. Um, if you have a really good painting and you feel that it's important, what the first sort of rule of thumb is you put gold around it, right? Like, because the gold is a nod while it's on your wall that other people, if they see it, should think that, oh, it must be important. If it simply has a painted wood frame or a natural wood frame, it mustn't be anything. But if you put nice gold around it, bright, shiny gold, it's an indicator that what's inside of it is important. Gold was used originally in picture framing because there was no electricity. So our spaces, our ancestors' spaces, were lit by flame, by fire, fireplace, candlelight, torches, things like this. So at night, when the lights go off outside, you have a bunch of flickering light sources. So if you take a wooden substrate, carve it, and have the outside of the frame further away from the inside where the painting is, and you carve it in a bunch of different planes with the ornamentation, that frame then had the ability to capture the light flickering there, and it would illuminate and glow that light source back into the painting. So those early frames, although they were also about the um, patron's ability to pay, <laughs> they could afford gold, but they also served a purpose, which was to light the inside. Um, this is a great painting. I hated the frame. This frame sort of speaks to all of the things that uh, I've seen so many pieces of art in this surround, and I think it's somewhat unfortunate, but sort of the same as Jeffrey's, although a little different. My client, however, said, this is a really important painting to me for a few reasons. She was a big fan of Mary Nichol. She had a number of her uh, clay prints, and then this was the first painting she could afford. So she buys it. She said to me, I don't want it in a dark frame. Like it has to have gold around it. Like I want it to feel important. And so there, a good framer, hopefully, listens to their client and tries their best to serve two, two people, the artwork itself and the client's desires. And so in this case, we have this hot, uh, 22 karat gold at the inner part surrounding that painting with a darker surround coming out from the outside. It hangs prominently above her fireplace in her condo and it's, uh, it's pretty great, in my opinion. You can hate it. We can talk about it later. I will take notes later. And there's the two. And I think, again, it's the same thing. It just, all of a sudden, you can see more detail in that painting on the, on the right side than you could on the left. Uh, this is a Nick de Grand Maison. It's an oil painting. Nick was known primarily for his uh, chalk drawings, portraiture of uh, First Nations people uh, uh, across Canada, but mostly in the prairies. This is a painting, uh, which is a little, not odd. There are Nick de Grand Maison paintings. Um, and so it came across my table about a year ago. And it's in a corporate collection, and the request was to just make it as good as it can be. Never tell your framer that. 
And then fortunately, they're not in oil and gas. They're in, commu <laughs> they're in communications. So they didn't ask for a quote. <laughs> so we were kind of like off to the races as to what we were to do with it. Um, so I'm just going to go to the next one because it kind of tells the story. So that's sort of the most dramatic. And I chose this redo because all of these moldings are available by everybody's frame shops all over the place. This is stock production molding, comes in 10 feet lengths. I cut it to size and join it. But this has one, two, three, four different profiles to make that one frame. And it speaks not only to perhaps the importance of the work, um, which does that, but it also speaks to the time at which the sitter would have sat. So there's a, there's a nod to history that's involved in this frame that I think also supports it. So right off, if I think about how I'm going to do these things, my first thought is I want it in a darker frame. Um, my second thought is, well, what's going on at the time? Not when... Nick made it, but if I, if so, in a way, I, I often think about my frames, this is so hokey, in sort of movie terms, right? Like sometimes when we talk about a gold frame, is, is it a gold frame that was always in a museum, or was it a gold frame that was at your grandmother's who gave it to your uncle who hated art that chucked it up in the attic and it sat there in the wet attic for a long time and then it went here 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 which would mean that frame needs to have more patina more scars more life to it so in this case I was really trying to think what may have been a saloon a proud a really proud frame uh, of the time that may work but again I didn't make this frame from scratch so uh, there's two parts to my practice and I'll show it to you. Yeah. So there's the two. Um, oh, and the plaque. <laughs> we love our plaques. Frame, frame shops don't necessarily. There's this thing that happens with collectors that they want to put the name on the thing. And it, it's, a, it's an older practice, perhaps, which is fine, because that's the person who painted it. It's usually the name of the artist, or sometimes the title of the work and the name of the artist. And it's there on that linen right in the middle so that your eye just goes to it all the time when you're looking at that thing. So I asked the client if it would be okay if I put the plaque on the back. So I don't know. I haven't seen it in situation. My guess is they've probably taken it and put it on that frame now. But uh, <laughs> plaques are always a bone of contention, perhaps. Uh, if you're worried about what the whole appearance of a frame is, is supposed to do, it's kind of detracting, I guess. And now we have something that's a little exciting in that we're going to see some family art <laughs> uh, collaborations between Jarvis and the members of his family. So I elaborated to the fact that that frame is a production frame. I also am a carver, gilder, frame maker. What, what that means is I make frames from scratch. I join raw basswood molding. I carve them. I apply undercoats and then I gild them with precious gold leaf, silver leaf, and then finish them the way frames have been made since the Renaissance period. And the way I do them now is the same materials and pretty much the same recipes as were done uh, in that time period. There's, no, there's, no, there's been no advancement in how this happens technically. So this is a frame on one of my mother's paintings. It's from, um, uh, it's an Easter procession painting that she made while living in Mexico. My parents lived there for about 20 years. So that's a painting she made and she gave it to me uh, with the caveat that I make a frame for it, but the frame could be of my choosing. Um, I've done three of her paintings in this fashion. She gives me the painting and then I'm free to produce a frame. The only thing being, she wanted it to represent a certain period of, of framing history or tradition. Uh, if I might, yeah. I think the other thing that she does is she <coughs> gives you the direction that she would like to see the painting sometime in her lifetime. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there's all of that stuff baked in there, uh, for sure. Yeah, here's the thing. This painting was a nightmare. 
It's a nightmare because of the way its format, the painting was on its own. My mother basically put a framing device right on it. That, that black uh, separator and, and surround is black lace that my mother applied with acrylic gesso to the surface of her painting. So it was kind of framed. And she gave it to me. I did the first two in fairly good, quick. You know, I was pretty good turnarounds. <sighs> but this one sat in my rack for about three years. And every time, you know, you'd make the phone call once a week home, <laughs> or every second week, depending how busy you are, mom, uh, and it would be near somewhere near the end of the phone call, it'd be, so how's that frame coming along? And I would say, oh. Reason was, I had a really tough time with how to frame this. Um, it's an Easter procession painting. I understand what the scene is. Um, I was trying to get my head around what, what could surround that lace uh, and still be sort of symbiotic and, and supportive. Um, I finally decided on this. It's a Spanish frame. It's uh, a Gudrun carved pattern with a sgraffito um, uh, panel. And I'm going to go to the next slide, which I will go quickly from left to right. So that's my mother's painting, as you can see um, on the first slide, far left. And it, that's my basswood. So I take basswood in different profiles, join them together, glue them up, ready for carving. The second picture is my starting to carve. Uh, basswood is the lightest, is the softest on the hardwoods. So it's pretty easy to carve and it doesn't have that, that nasty sap, hard sap uh, uh, grain that pines and other things have. The next picture where it's white, that's after it's been fully carved, that's Gilder's gesso. So not the gesso you buy at the art supply store. I make gesso from hide glue. So in this case, um, animal glue, hide glue from cows, distilled water, and marble dust. And I use the same basic recipe that Santini used um, in the early 15, Hundreds, so very early on. And you make this mixture warm and it becomes like a thick paint that's warm and you apply it to the wood. You do it, in this case, it had 14 coats of gesso and one has to be brushed on to the next drying layer at a certain time. So once you start, you can't leave the shop, you can't answer the phone, you're tied to that frame. If the gesso dries too much in one of those coats, when you do the final burnishing, you'll separate the gesso at that earlier stage. So hot, hot coat of gesso, look at it, about 20 minutes later in Calgary, the top start to dry, the low areas are wet, you put another coat and you build up, you're hoping for an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch of this gesso. And then you let it dry and then you smooth it with wet silk. So you take fine silk, distilled water, and you polish away all of the brush marks and you get a perfectly smooth, like a, like a porcelain teacup, that smooth. So the gesso is there to hide the wood. The wood's there to, to accept the carving, but then you don't want the wood to show. So you cover it with the gesso, you smooth it, and then you need something for the clay, for the gold to stick to, and that's clay. So I take this time, sorry Shannon, rabbit skin glue. <laughs> so it's literally instead of cows as the, as the gelatin, it's from rabbits. Um, you take rabbit skin glue, water, and in this time you use French or Armenian bowl. And it's clay that has been passed through the most uh, um, screens until it's got the least amount of pumice to it and you add that, make a slurry and paint it on. Yellow on the low areas and red on the high points. The reason for this is I'm a water gilder. I can do oil gilding, dry gilding, and that means you put a varnish down, it stays tacky for a while, you put gold on it, and eventually the, the varnish dries and your gold is stuck to the wood. In water gilding, because I've got the rabbit skin glue in the clay, I actually take alcohol, not vodka, <laughs> it's Gilder's alcohol, which is isopropyl alcohol and distilled water, and brush it on the clay. At a certain point, the clay saturates with the water until it can take no more, and if you brush more water on that area, it stays on the surface. 
And then what you have is tension, right? You have the surface tension of the water, at which point you have a book of gold, you have a gilder's tip, which is a flat badger hair brush. You pick up a leaf of gold and you drop it on the water. When that dries, you've permanently adhered gold to clay. Why does this matter? It matters because you can then, once it's dry, take an agate stone that's fixed to a rock. Usually they make them to look like dog's tooth, burnishers. You can polish your gold. And all of the great gilded objects have areas that are burnish and areas that are matte. And if you dry gild or, or varnish gild, you can't polish it because you'll only disturb the varnish underneath. So this next photo, okay, the one with the gold is when it's been laid and burnished. And that's not enough for my mom. <laughs> so then I have to make the panel. So for the scraffito, which in Ita Italian is to scratch, and you're actually revealing, lots of people assume that you paint gold, like painted gold and you make your design. You actually lay your gold underneath, cover it with um, egg tempera paint in a certain consistency. And within, again, a certain amount of time, <laughs> it has to be dry enough to not be wet, but not so dry that you can't pass a little wooden stylus. So all of that ornamentation is done by hand, drawn and scratched to show the gold. Um, and then, yeah, so the picture, uh, bottom row, third over, is it, it basically finished. But gold is really shiny. And every gilded object that we see, are like historical frames, if you're making reproductions, they've been around for three, 400 years. So life has happened to them. They've been touched. They've had, you know, all the contaminants from all those fires and all of those homes, all those years build up a patina, basically breaks the gold down. So the last image there is just my attempt and every everybody making a reproduction historical frame does the stage called patina. We build a patina, a natural patina, fly specks. Um, we knock them around, we put wax on and we apply dust to them so the dust gets down in the nooks and crannies or can find a little bit into the wormhole. And we do all of this work so that you don't notice it. Because if it's done right, you shouldn't know that it was done today. If the best compliment I've ever received is, that frame is perfect for that painting, thank goodness, and when I turn it around to show the brand new wood on the back, they're shocked that it happened last week. So we're always sort of playing with that idea where that movie theme comes into it. We're sort of, we're telling a tale, right? And we hope we're doing it well. So Jarvis, I think I, like everybody else, would like to see, go back to the yeah. painting. And... So. So that has about 225 hours. So ha, when my father asked for a deal, <laughs> which he got, um, it's a funny thing like uh, frame, frame making, we know framing is expensive. This is like more expensive, but we get to a point where the client will put a number in the check and, I'll, and, I, and I will agree to accept that number on that check, but I will never recoup the hours put in, at least not here. There's other centers in the world, uh, London, New York, Paris, um, Los Angeles, other major centers that have 10 of me <laughs> with big productions doing lots of production antique replica frames and they get a pretty good dollar for what they do. Um, here, it's, a, it's like a furniture maker, I suppose. The really good furniture makers probably in their lifetime never see the actual investment back out of it. We just get to a point where it's like, yeah, that'll, yeah, okay, that's good. But I also have this beautiful life of doing that, right? And, and, and making something from scratch. 
that few sort of people can do, at least in this area, and sort of being able to champion this craft that's, uh, it's not gone, it's not forgotten, but it's definitely um, sort of lagging. So that's part of the pay. Um, it's very much, I suppose, like an artist in the studio. Lots of artists don't read, like nobody writes their hours down, right? Like it's just part of the, the thing. So you gave us a sneak preview of Janine's yeah. painting. This is a painting by my sister Janine. Um, it's of her eldest son, Dexter, my nephew. Um, it's a fantastic uh, painting in my opinion. Um, I'm biased, but I think it's pretty good. Um, this painting was kind of a no-brainer for, for what to do with it. It just re it, it yelled um, Flemish portrait, Dutch painting. So for me as a frame maker, it was dead simple. Let's make a, a, a Dutch surround for it and use very little gold. So um, again, I tell my clients that the frame is expensive because it's real gold, right? No, it's always ours, not gold cost. Um, th this frame is done in a way that we call um, ebonizing wood. Um, when you could get ebony, they would make frames from it. And then at a certain point, they could no longer get ebony um, in Europe. So they had a process in which they could make other uh, base woods look like ebony. And so this frame has, yes, it has the gesso. Yes, it has the clay. But then it has about seven different layers on top of that to create that black sort of patina and lacquer. Um, I don't know. I. It's one of my favorites. Um, I love that it's, it seems to be from two times. Like he's sitting with a motorcycle helmet under his arm, right? That's, that's the, the, the handlebars from, from his motorcycle. He's in a leather jacket. And then you have the roses and you have that dark ground and it sort of speaks of a different time. So that frame in this case, um, uh, I think is a delight because it, it does allow for it to perhaps live in different in different periods, yeah. Um, is that, uh, yeah. Um, this is a painting by the French painter Camille Corot. Um, it used to live in Calgary, but it's since moved elsewhere. Um, this was not Camille, the painting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Camille died about yeah a long time two hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is late period, so mid mid eighteen hundreds, we'll say. Um, I, I had a client who I believe my sister had done some portraits for him and I had done some gilding. So he knew that I could make frames from scratch, but they were contemporary frames I had made. And this came to him from a, a, an auction house in Europe unframed. And I've never seen that. Like almost every painting at auction in Europe, they can find a frame somewhere to put the painting in to sell it, but it came to him unframed. So he visited me one day and said, what do you think? And I said, oh, it's a Corot, and I have a few ideas. Why don't we see what we can do? It was at a point in my shop, I was, uh, I had left Paul's in, Paul Kuhn Fine Arts in 05. So this is maybe 2008. So I'm fairly new to my own framing business, but I was full of um, energy and, and wanted to make one of these great frames. The reason I wanted to make this frame, it's a Louis XV frame. I won't get into the time periods necessarily, but uh, French gilding and picture frames are like Louis XIII, 14, 15, 16, 17. And the style changes from king to king over that period of time. And this is smack dab in the middle, which was sort of the most ornate of the, of, of the, of the Louis. <laughs> so, I knew I wanted to make this frame. I didn't know when I was ever gonna be able to make it, and a Corot walks into my frame shop in the prairies, in Calgary, Alberta. Like, doesn't happen ever. So, I sat him down, I, I, I put together a package, and we got together, and I said, this is what I would like to do. Then he said, sure. And I said, you saw the second page? He said, yes. <laughs> So I thought, well, wow, great, let's do it. This is not a carved frame. I don't want there to be a confusion about that. In the late 1700s, a gilding uh, work, uh, carving guild in France, somebody figures out 
how to make this material that you could press into a mold, flip it out, and then steam it and apply it to wood to speed up the process of making picture frames, carved objects. So this is actually a compo frame. So I ordered all of the compo from the, the leading maker of compo ornaments in the US. They use all the molds they can find in Europe. So they buy the old molds and bring them over and make their compo. It comes to me flat, hard, in that shape, those details, and then you put them over a water bath on a piece of silk, and the steam activates the compo and it gets soft, and you can then put, put it on your frame and mold it to take the shape. So in the history of framing and gilded objects, I used to think, naively, because I came about this as being self-taught, that it had to be carved to be any good. I've certainly realized that from 1790 whatever, when they figured this stuff out, to present, there's been a number of remarkable frames that are actually not carved at all, their compositional material. So this is a, a, a Louis XV French sweat frame in 22 karat gold leaf for that Corot painting. And I'm kind of proud of that. It, it's, that Corot is about like this. The frame was uh, five and a half inches around that. So substantial. So, so Jarvis and I had a discussion about this and I said, so let's figure out how much money per hour you made making this and we worked it all out and it comes to 37 cents an hour. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty close. <laughs> It, yeah, uh, absolutely. Totally. <laughs> but it's a beautiful thing, and you made it. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I still I looked at this photo. I, I looked for some images for this talk, and I hadn't been on this old hard drive for a while. I've done a lot of frames. They keep sort of coming, and they keep happening, and that's great. So I hadn't looked back for a long time. And I went through, and you said I was modest, but here I am being not that. I actually looked for a second, I thought, I thought, oh, I did do it. <laughs> I made that, and it's pretty good, right? Because you, it's long enough away that you sort of forget. And these are, the, these are the frames we see in the museums all the time. Like if you're buying Impressionism, it's going in one of those frames. If you go to the Met, there's room upon room upon room of that frame in slightly different uh, approaches. But basically, that's, that's, the, big, that's the big frame of, of the last century. But it's fair to say, I think, that you are the only person in this room who could make a frame like that. <laughs> <laughs> if I talk, train you long enough, you can do it too. I've had lots of people work for me, I gotta say. Um, John Belletta, Kyle Beale, Jared Tiller, uh, uh, Ryan Statz, um, I've had uh, Matt Bury, uh, who passed recently. I've, I've had a lot of uh, Stacy Bliss. I've had a lot of really good people that have worked with me in the shop that have had horrible jobs. Like, make the gesso. Like, get the hide glue out and boil the water and do all of that. And they didn't really, uh, nobody stayed long enough to learn how to lay leaf, so that tells me something. <laughs> uh, but no, I just wanted to thank all of those folks that have helped this practice. It's not just the one person thing. And now we have a special tree. Yeah, I was just going to ask a question about that. Yeah. Frame, I mean, sometimes in museums, you see these frames and they're, they, they're cracked because of humidity and what have you. Yeah. With a Calgary climate, have you had issues with that? With uh, this, uh, is it gypsum that they're using in that compound? No, it's, it's uh, the, the cracking almost always happens to the wood beneath. So the wooden joint will open up over time. It'll shrink and it shrinks at the nose or the corner where the corner of the painting is, it'll start to get away from itself there. And usually the back hip of a painting will stay relatively tight. And it's a, it's as the, as the moisture comes out of the wood over time, it just moves. And then, of course, everything above that crack can't go anywhere, so it goes with it. So you get these cracks. I'm not so concerned. Initially, I was. I would hate for a new frame to crack. So I have to go in and fix a crack if it happens while I'm making it. But if it, if, it, if it dries out and cracks 10 years from now, 
I'm okay because every gilded object I've ever seen has got an open nose in the corner and it has a certain amount of cracking. Just, you have, you have wood, you've got <coughs> gelatin, you've got marble, you've got all these natural things in there, something is gonna give over time. But, so I, I don't worry about it too much. So we have a special treat here tonight. Uh, Jarvis is going to share his uh, most recent collaboration with his dad. So we'll just go and bring something out. We My father made the painting here with the Christ figure on the cross in 1967. That's the year I was born. My sister was two. Um, my father in the last few years has looked over paintings that he at some point didn't sell or kept or whatever. He rolls them up in tubes and puts them away. And Part of what he's been investigating lately is more uh, the, the full-on trompe l'oeil of what um, a painting can be. Trompe l'oeil meaning to fool the eye, to make something look so realistic that you think you're looking at something you're not. So in this case, this back painting, this is the painting itself, 1967. The new painting was done last year. And so that's, when an artist doesn't like a painting and they don't have a lot of money for canvas, they'll often take that painting off the stretcher, turn it around, put it back on, and they'll paint the back of the canvas because it has no paint on it, so they can start again. So the idea here for this painting is that my father is saying to the viewer, this is a painting that's been turned over to paint the other side. These stretcher bars are painted on top of the original painting. All This is my father, a postcard of my father in 68. Uh, this is a photograph, and it looks like a Partial review of the painting. This used to have two panels on the side. And it said, well, it certainly, and he covered it up. So I don't know if it's a good review or bad. This is a Philip Perlstein postcard. This is like my classic, my father's inside jokes or curiosities. There's a envelope attached to the back that says for Ian Locke, J-H. And Ian Locke, Locke Gallery represents my father's work in Toronto and in, in Calgary and in Winnipeg. Um, so my father says to me, I need you to make a, paint, a frame that appears to be the back of a frame, right? And so I did one on the first painting like this he did, and uh, basically I had an old frame, <laughs> European frame, and I flat sliced the back off it and rebuilt it to go around that painting. My father liked it, but he made this one and he said, now listen, Jarv, is what he calls me. He said, Jarv, on the phone, he says, Jarv, this time I want it to be a collaboration. And I actually want you to make the frame. So for him, there's all of this trompe l'oeil business going on in the painting. He wanted me to essentially do the same thing with the wood surround. So what I decided to do here is there was a tradition of tramp art uh, frames and objects from last century early on. Uh, carvers would go to truck stop stores, they would take the fruit boxes, nothing was plastic, everything was shipped in a wooden box with that slat wood. We've all seen them, the Okanagan fruit boxes. They would take those apart and then they would cobble them together to be a picture frame and they would chip carve them with, with uh, jack, jackknife, pocket knives. And then they would in turn sell them to uh, the people that owned the stores, the people that were stopping at the truck stop, that was their way of making a living. They would make these objects. So what I said for this one was instead of making a European frame, which would kind of be boring in terms of the rear joinery, I decided to do this as if it was a tramp art frame. So tramp art was always lap jointed. There were always bits that would be fashioned and attached on from the back cobbled together. They didn't have uh, woodworking studios to do it, right? So it was like, however we can get it done, we'll get it done. So this was new wood that was um, mill sawn out of Ontario about two months ago. And then I've made it so that it also adds to the fooling of the eye that what you're looking at is the back. When we take it out of here, we'll turn it around to show you what the actual back looks like. The other thing that frames always have are notations on the back. So 
you want the reappel with the Parisian gallery label. Because it means it was one of the reappels that was sold in Paris. Right? Way more, way, supposedly way better, all of these things. So collectors want to see the backs of the frames because that's where we put the notes. So in my playing with my father's sort of autobiographical uh, notes to his new painting, um, I've attached some labels. This is a Garth Drabinsky gallery, a Drabinsky gallery frame. Garth Drabinsky is notorious, uh, and he did have a gallery in which he sold contemporary art in Toronto. But he never showed my father's work, but he was one of my father's biggest collectors. So in the late 70s, right through the 80s, Garth amassed a vast collection of my father's paintings. Um, so for my father, I used the uh, Drabinsky Gallery label here. This is an old antique label from a a uh, frame seller, antique seller in New York City, because who knows, maybe that's where the frame showed up. There's a, in chalk, a note down here, which you can't see, but it just says, Kyle, save for John Hall's Frente. Thanks, Jarvis. Uh, when you get an old frame, you'll mark it with chalk on the back if you're gonna use it again, or if it can go in the dumpster, or if you have a thought of what it might be used for. And I don't do it very much, but I've seen on a lot of old vintage frames these notations in pencil or in chalk. So that is a note to my history of having worked with Kyle Beale in my frame shop and, and adding to that story there. Um, this is a label from a picture seller in Toronto. This label's brand new because my father here, sorry folks, uh, has titled the back as he does all of his canvases as if there's a painting back here. So this label is the label that Locke made for me for the painting that's on the other side that would be brand new. So it's there and a auction, little auction label. Um, so that's, I don't know, it's maybe not the greatest frame I've ever made, uh, but it's sure, uh, it speaks to my father's history, my family's history, all of these things, right? So it's, you know, I think it, it ends up being pretty important to me, uh, hopefully to, to them. And uh, I don't know, I think it's a treat. These are never really meant to be hung on the wall. They lose their jam if they're hung. <laughs> they're best rested. So when we put it back, if you want to go in, you know, after the talk and take a look. It'll be in there rested as it would be. Um, so right down to like the hardware to hang the back of the painting. These are hurricane clips to hold it in the crate properly so it doesn't move around. Uh, these clips are not quite touching the face of the painting, but those are the actual clips. One of my favorite parts is my father can render uh, metal so well. And then I have a real clip there. And in photograph, you almost can't tell which one's real and which one's painted. So let's turn it around, Jeff, quick. Sure. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll do the heavy lifting. That's yeah. why I like going to Jarvis's shop. He always does the heavy lifting. <laughs> so yeah, that's the other side. So it's like brand new wood. Like it's a pretty, it's a really pretty tricky painting. It's pretty fantastic. Okay, well, I think that um, we're both standing here, so we're going to uh, end our talk now by my thanking Jarvis for, um, for teaching me an awful lot of his craft. And I think we can all agree that in their family there are four fantastic <laughs> artists, not just three. Jarvis and I'll put this painting in that room and then we'll come back and answer some of your questions.